Section 6 of The Stratagems and the Aqueducts of Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark DeSanzo. The Stratagems and the Aqueducts of Rome by Frontinus. Translated by Charles Bennett. The Stratagems, Book 2, Part 1 having in book one given classes of examples which as i believe will suffice to instruct a general in those matters which are to be attended to before beginning battle i will next in order present examples which will bear on those things that are usually done on the battle itself and then those that come subsequent to the engagement of those which concern the battle itself there are the following classes one on choosing the time for battle two on choosing the place for battle three on the disposition of troops for battle four on creating panic in the enemy's ranks five on ambushes six on letting the enemy escape lest brought to bay he renew the battle in desperation seven on concealing reverses eight on restoring morale by firmness of the matters which deserve attention after battle i consider that there are the following classes nine on bringing the war to a close after a successful engagement ten on repairing one's losses after a reverse eleven on ensuring the loyalty of those whom one mistrusts twelve what to do for the defense of a camp in case a commander lacks confidence in his present forces thirteen on retreating one on choosing the time for battle when Publius Scipio was in Spain and had learned that Hasdrubal, leader of the Carthaginians, had marched out and drawn up his troops in battle array early in the morning before they had had breakfast, he kept back his own men till one o'clock, having ordered them to rest and eat. When the enemy, exhausted with hunger, thirst, and waiting under arms, had begun to return to camp, Scipio suddenly led forth his troops, opened battle, and won the day when metellus pius was waging war against hertulius in spain and the latter had drawn up his troops immediately after daybreak and marched them against metellus's entrenchments metellus held his own forces in camp till noon as the weather at that time of year was extremely hot then when the enemy were overcome by the heat he easily defeated them since his own men were fresh and their strength unimpaired when the same metellus had joined forces with pompey against sertorius in spain and had repeatedly offered battle the enemy declined combat deeming himself unequal to two later on however metellus noticing that the soldiers of the enemy fired with great enthusiasm were calling for battle bearing their arms and brandishing their spears thought it best to retreat betimes before their ardor accordingly he withdrew and caused pompey to do the same when postumius was in sicily in his consulate his camp was three miles distant from the carthaginians every day the punic chieftains drew up their lines of battle directly in front of the fortifications of the romans while postumius offered resistance by way of constant skirmishes conducted by a small band before his entrenchments as soon as the carthaginian commander came to regard this as a matter of course Postumius quietly made ready all the rest of his troops within the ramparts, meeting the assault of the foe with a few, according to his former practice, but keeping them engaged longer than usual. When afternoon was passed, they were retreating, weary and suffering from hunger. Postumius, with fresh troops, put them to rout, exhausted as they were by the aforementioned embarrassments. Epicrates, the Athenian, having discovered that the enemy regularly ate at the same hour, commanded his own troops to eat at an earlier hour and then led them out to battle when the enemy came forth he so detained them as to afford them no opportunity either of fighting or of withdrawing then as the day drew to a close he led his troops back but nevertheless held them under arms the enemy exhausted both by standing in the line and by hunger straightway hurried off to rest and eat whereupon Epicrates again led forth his troops, and finding the enemy disorganized, attacked their camp. When the same Epicrates had his camp for several days near the Lacedaemonians, and each side was in the habit of going forth at a regular hour for forage and wood, he one day sent out slaves and camp followers in the dress of soldiers for this service, holding back his fighting men. 
and as soon as the enemy had dispersed on similar errands, he captured their camp. Then, as they came running back from all quarters to the melee, unarmed and carrying their bundles, he easily slew or captured them. When the consul Virginius, in the war with the Volscians, saw the enemy run forward at full stretch from a distance, he commanded his own men to keep steady and hold their javelins at rest. Then, when the enemy were out of breath, while his own army was still strong and fresh, he attacked and routed them. Since Fabius Maximus was well aware that the Gauls and Samnites were strong in the initial attack, while the tireless spirits of his own men actually waxed hotter as the struggle continued, he commanded his soldiers to rest, content with holding the foe at the first encounter, and to wear them out by delay. When this succeeded, bringing up reinforcements to his men in the van and attacking with his full strength, he crushed and routed the enemy. At Caronia, Philip purposely prolonged the engagement, mindful that his own soldiers were seasoned by long experience, while the Athenians were ardent but untrained and impetuous only in the charge. Then, as the Athenians began to grow weary, Philip attacked more furiously and cut them down. When the Spartans learned from scouts that the Mycenaeans had broken out into such fury that they had come down to battle attended by their wives and children, they postponed the engagement. In the civil war, when Gaius Caesar held the army of Afranius and Petraeus besieged and suffering from thirst, and when their troops, infuriated because of this, had slain all their beasts of burden and come out for battle, Caesar held back his own soldiers, deeming the occasion ill-suited for an engagement, since his opponents were so inflamed with wrath and desperation. Neus Pompey, desiring to check the flight of Mithridates and force him to battle, chose night as the time for the encounter, arranging to block his march as he withdrew. Having made his preparations accordingly, he suddenly forced his enemy to fight. In addition to this, he so drew up his force that the moonlight falling in the faces of the Pontic soldiers blinded their eyes, while it gave his own troops a distinct and clear view of the enemy. It is well known that Jugurtha, aware of the courage of the Romans, was always wont to engage in battle as the day was drawing to a close, so that, in case his men were routed, they might have the advantage of night for getting away. At Tegrandoserta in Greater Armenia, Lucullus, in the campaign against Mithridates and Tigranes, did not have above fifteen thousand armed men, while the enemy had an innumerable host, which for this very reason was unwieldy. Taking advantage, accordingly, of this handicap of the foe, Lucullus attacked their line before it was in order, and straightway routed it so completely that even the kings themselves discarded their trappings and fled. In the campaign against the Pannonians, when the barbarians in warlike mood had formed for battle at the very break of day, Tiberius Nero held back his own troops, and allowed the enemy to be hampered by the fog and be drenched with the showers, which happened to be frequent that day. Then, when he noticed they were weary with standing and faint not only from exposure but also from exhaustion, he gave the signal, attacked, and defeated them. Gaius Caesar, when in Gaul, learned that it was a principle and almost a law with Ariovistus, king of the Germans, not to fight when the moon was waning. Caesar therefore chose that time, above all others, for engaging in battle, when the enemy were embarrassed by their superstition, and so conquered them. The deified Vespasian Augustus attacked the Jews on their Sabbath, a day on which it is sinful for them to do any business, and so defeated them. When Lysander the Spartan was fighting against the Athenians at Agopistami, he began by attacking the vessels of the Athenians at a regular hour and then calling off his fleet. After this had become an established procedure, as the Athenians on one occasion, after his withdrawal, were dispersing to collect their troops, he deployed his fleet as usual and withdrew it. Then, when most of the enemy had scattered according to their wont, he attacked and slew the rest and captured all their vessels. 2. On Choosing the Place for Battle Manius Curius, observing that the phalanx of King Pyrrhus could not be resisted when in extended order, took pains to fight in confined quarters, where the phalanx, being massed together, would embarrass itself. In Cappadocia, Neus Pompey chose a lofty site for his camp. As a result, the elevation so assisted the onset of his troops that he easily overcame Mithridates by the sheer weight of his assault. When Gaius Caesar was about to contend with Pharnaces, son of Mithridates, he drew up his line of battle on a hill. 
This move made victory easy for him, since the darts hurled from higher ground against the barbarians charging from below straightway put them to flight. When Lucullus was planning to fight Mithridates and Tigranes at Tigranocerta in Greater Armenia, he himself swiftly gained the level top of the nearest hill with a part of his troops, and then rushed down upon the enemy posted below, at the same time attacking their cavalry on the flank. When the cavalry broke and straightway threw the infantry into confusion, Lucullus followed after them and gained a most notable victory. Ventidius, when fighting against the Parthians, would not lead out his soldiers until the Parthians were within five hundred paces. Thus, by a rapid advance, he came so near them that, meeting them at close quarters, he escaped their arrows, which they shoot from a distance. By this scheme, since he exhibited a certain show of confidence, he quickly subdued the barbarians. At Numistro, when Hannibal was expecting a battle with Marcellus, he secured a position where his flank was protected by hollows and precipitous roads. By thus making the ground serve as a defense, he won a victory over a most renowned commander. Again at Cani, when Hannibal learned that the Volturnus River, at variance with the nature of other streams, sent out high winds in the morning which carried swirling sand and dust, he so marshaled his line of battle that the entire fury of the elements fell on the rear of his own troops, but struck the Romans in the face and eyes. Since this difficulty was a serious obstacle to the enemy, he won that memorable victory. After Marius had settled on a day for fighting the Cimbrians and Teutons, he fortified his soldiers with food and stationed them in front of his camp, in order that the army of the enemy might be exhausted by marching over the interval between the opposing armies. Then, when the enemy were thus used up, he confronted them with another embarrassment by so arranging his own line of battle that the barbarians were caught with the sun and wind and dust in their faces. When Cleomenes the Spartan, in his battle against Hippias the Athenian, found that the latter's main strength lay in his cavalry, he thereupon felled trees and cluttered the battlefield with them, thus making it impassable for cavalry. The Iberians in Africa, upon encountering a great multitude of foes and fearing that they would be surrounded, drew near a river which at that point flowed along between deep banks. Thus, defended by the river in the rear, and enabled by their superior prowess to make frequent onsets upon those nearest them, they routed the entire host of their adversaries. Xanthippus the Spartan, by merely changing the locality of operations, completely altered the fortunes of the Punic War. For when, summoned as a mercenary by the despairing Carthaginians, he had noticed that the Africans, who were superior in cavalry and elephants, kept to the hills, while the Romans, whose strength was in their infantry, held to the plains, he brought the Carthaginians down to level ground, where he broke the ranks of the Romans with the elephants. Then, pursuing their scattered troops with Numidians, he routed their army, which till that day had been victorious on land and sea. Epaminondas, leader of the Thebans, when about to marshal his troops in battle array against the Spartans, ordered his cavalry to engage in maneuvers along the front. Then, when he had filled the eyes of the enemy with clouds of dust and had caused them to expect an encounter with cavalry, he led his infantry around to one side, where it was possible to attack the enemy's rear from higher ground, and thus, by a surprise attack, cut them to pieces. Against a countless horde of Persians, three hundred Spartans seized and held the pass of Thermopylae, which was capable of admitting only a like number of hand-to-hand -hand opponents. In consequence, the Spartans became numerically equal to the barbarians, so far as opportunity for fighting was concerned, and being superior to them in valor, slew large numbers of them. Nor would they have been overcome had not the enemy been led around to the rear by the traitor Ephialtes, the Trachinian, and thus been enabled to overwhelm them. Themistocles, leader of the Athenians, saw that it was most advantageous for Greece to fight in the Straits of Salamis against the vast number of Xerxes' vessels, but he was unable to persuade his fellow Athenians of this. He therefore employed a stratagem to make the barbarians force the Greeks to do what was advantageous for the latter. For under pretense of turning traitor, he sent a messenger to Xerxes to inform him that the Greeks were planning flight, and that the situation would be more difficult for the king if he should besiege each city separately. By this policy, in the first place he caused the host of the barbarians to be kept on the alert doing guard duty all night. In the second place he made it possible for his own followers, the next morning with strength unimpaired, 
to encounter the barbarians all exhausted with watching and precisely as he had wished in a confined place where xerxes could not utilize his superiority in numbers End of section six.